whirlwind week ahead on Capitol Hill. Republicans facing to get their, uh, racing to get their tax bill on the president's desk by year's end as they also face a possible government shutdown as soon as Friday and looming large new White House concerns about the Russia investigation. <clears throat> That's a mouthful. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom and a brand new week as well. I'm Sandra Smith. How was your weekend? It was fabulous. Excellent. My, my nephew won his football game. Congratulations so stay champs. to him. Nicely done. I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning at home. Uh, Republican lawmakers in both chambers will try to hammer out a deal on a bill, a final tax reform bill, after the Senate passed its version early Saturday morning. With the finish line now in sight, they say and argue it needs to get done now. Here's Tim Scott from yesterday. Our tax code must be competitive with the rest of the rest of the world. When that happens, American companies will churn out more profits, more revenues to the government, and we will be able to deal with our national debt. When we take our tax rates, the corporate rates, from one of the highest in the world to now one of the lower tax rates in the world, we have a global economy. Money will come rushing into the United States. We have to get the tax revenues up. That means we have to get back to a healthy American economy, grow the economy so that you make more money, I make more money, ordinary Americans make more money, and so does the government. That helps lessen the deficit. We have Fox team coverage. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts covering all the bases there. White House legislative director Mark Short is also on deck. But first, we start with Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel live on Capitol Hill on this Monday morning. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Sandra. Christmas is three weeks from today, so if President Trump wants tax reform on his desk by then, lawmakers must act swiftly and efficiently. We will have a motion to go to conference today, vote on that tonight, and then we will name our conferees. The Senate will do the same this week, and we will get to work on the differences. There's not a lot of differences, but there are some, and we'll, we'll come to a common ground and get it done. So as the Senate and House prepare to go to that conference, bottom line is there's still plenty of work ahead and some Democrats are complaining about the process that led up to that late night vote in the Senate. One was, this was Swamp 101, the process on Friday night where the bill was being hand-drafted. Lots of provisions were being included for special interest. One got exposed already. There's also the issue of funding the government beyond Friday and expect the topic of disaster relief to be big this week. Delegations from Florida and Texas want more money to help with their hurricane recovery efforts. Then the California delegation, both Democrats and Republicans, wants more money for wildlife relief efforts. They want about $4.4 billion to help recover from that devastation. And there isn't much time before the government runs out of money at the end of this week. Nobody wants to shut down. I don't sense that that's going to come uh, unless it's through mutual misunderstanding uh, between the two sides. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says confidently there will not be a government shutdown. Another busy week ahead. Sandra. All right, Mike Emanuel, live on Capitol Hill for us. Thank you. Meanwhile, another big story today from the White House on his way to Utah as we speak. The president responding to Michael Flynn's guilty plea Friday in special counsel Mueller's Russia probe, as well as calling out the FBI in no uncertain terms after Mueller fires a top FBI agent over the weekend for anti-Trump texts. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts live from the briefing room now. Hey, John, good morning. Bill, good morning to you. You know, the president was talking about this over the weekend on Twitter, but it's the first time we had the chance to put the question to him in person. As he was on his way to the helicopter headed to Salt Lake City, the president stopped to talk briefly about what he was going to be doing in Utah. And then as he moved his way down the line, I asked him for his reaction uh, to the Michael Flynn uh, guilty plea on Friday. Here's what the president told us. Listen here. Well, I feel badly for General Flynn. I feel very badly. He's led a very uh, strong life, and I feel very badly, John. I will say this. Uh, Hillary Clinton lied many times to the FBI. Nothing happened to her. Flynn lied, and they destroyed his life. I think it's a shame. Hillary Clinton, on the 4th of July weekend, went to the FBI, not under oath. It was the most incredible thing anyone's ever seen. She lied many times. Nothing happened to her. Flynn lied, and it's like they ruined his life very unfair. And the president was tweeting over the weekend about a, a dot that he connected there between the Hillary Clinton investigation and the revelation that one of the former chief investigators for the FBI in that investigation, Peter Stroke, was removed from the White House special, or at least from uh, Mueller's special counsel uh, investigation uh, last summer after it was found that he was exchanging text messages with somebody that were both uh, anti-Trump 
and pro-Hillary. The president tweeting over the weekend, quote, report anti-Trump FBI agent led Clinton email probe. Now it all starts to make sense. Also including the former FBI director James Comey in his criticism saying, quote, after years of Comey with the phony and dishonest Clinton investigation and more running the FBI, its reputation is in tatters worst in history, but fear not, we will bring it back to greatness. The president also making news uh, earlier today with a tweet that appears to the first time, for the first time uh, to be the president endorsing Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore, though some people might say that the president is not saying anything different than he said in the last two or three weeks in regards to Moore. The president tweeting, Democrats' refusal to give even one vote for massive tax cuts is why we need Republican Roy Moore to win in Alabama. We need his vote on stopping crime, illegal immigration, border wall military, pro-life VA judges, Second Amendment, and more. No to Jones, a Pelosi-Schumer puppet. Now, saying we need to have Roy Moore to win in Alabama, for all intents and purposes, is seen as an endorsement bill. But, uh, again, uh, people here at the White House saying, well, it's nothing different than the president really has been saying for the past few weeks. Um, on the tax plan, John, where does it stand from the White House perspective? Well, the White House is very, very uh, excited about uh, everything that happened on Friday. Uh, there's been talk uh, that, you know, they might skip the conference here and simply have the House vote in the Senate proposal. Uh, the White House is uh, kind of throwing cold water on that idea. They do think that there is going to be a conference. They think that some conferees will be probably appointed later on today, if not tonight. Uh, the White House, though, hoping that that conference will be short and sweet. The Senate bill was adjusted to look more like the House bill in the closing hours before the vote. So that may speed up the process. One of the big questions here is how much the White House injects itself into the process. You know, the president has been talking about wanting to have the corporate tax rate held at 20 percent. There's some talk that in conference that corporate tax may rise to give tax breaks in other areas. The, the big question here, will the president allow that to happen or will he jump in there and say, no, this is a red line, as he has said in the past, and say it's got to be 20 percent? Uh, White House hopes to have this thing all wrapped up and on the president's desk the week of December the 18th. We'll see, Bill, if they can do that. Uh, indeed. Thank you, John. John Roberts, the latest from the briefing room there. Sandra. White House Legislative Director Mark Short joins me now. Mark, good morning to you on a very busy day, a busy week for the White House. If I could first ask you about the big Friday deadline for a possible government shutdown, what happens next? Well, I think, Sandra, what you'll see is another continuing resolution to afford us more time to continue negotiations. I think what Washington has seen as its dysfunction over the last several years is Congress's inability to actually pass appropriations bills, which leads us into the situation of continuing resolutions. But uh, we are making progress in conversations. We think we'll be able to, to, to have a deal that, that paves the way for a spending bill, but uh, likely we'll have a short-term continuing resolution to make sure the government stays uh, functioning and we continue to make sure our national security interests are paid for. You know, that seems to be the thinking right now because the House GOP has proposed this two-week continuing resolution. What could derail yeah. that with so much happening? And it's not your typical uh, December days here. There's a lot going on, an aggressive agenda laid out. Uh, what, what could get in the way of that happening and actually, actually cause a problem here? We honestly, I, I think that everybody feels pretty comfortable that uh, that this will move along smoothly. The one thing that could get in the way, frankly, is that in the Senate you'll need 60 votes for that. So uh, Democrats have said that they want to have uh, DACA resolved before a spending bill. And so if they inject amnesty uh, immigration solutions into this debate, it could slow it down. Uh, but uh, we, again, we believe that uh, there will be interest to continue to buy more time to allow us to continue those negotiations. Considering it could come down to Democrats and they could become key in keeping the government open uh, with House GOP seeking this two-week resolution and then potentially another one to get through the holidays, uh, yeah. the president has been adamant that he does not want to tie that DACA legislative fix to the budget deal. Where does he stand on that this morning? Well, actually, it's not just the president, frankly. If you look back to what uh, Leader Schumer and Leader Pelosi have said in the past is that they've argued that we should not be tying policy riders onto end-of-year spending bills. And so we want to make sure that we're striking a bill that, first and foremost, funds our military. There's a lot of national security concerns that we have, particularly as you see what's happening in North Korea. And what we've allowed over the last 10 years is military to be hollowed out. The president has said we need to make sure we, we fill the the resources that the pentagon needs and so that's our first priority with the spending bill and we also have border security needs but the president is also interested in finding a resolution to daca he has said that but he believes that that should not be tied to a spending bill where basically you're holding the until, funding of our government hostage and he has until march to, to make a decision on that unless that's pushed right. to do so um, by those senate democrats who are making that a key issue with the budget deal i want to talk taxes this morning because yeah. 
The president says this is going to be a big Christmas present for the American people, and it came down to the wee hours of Saturday morning uh, to see the Senate bill pass. Mm -hmm. And now what happens? How We're going to clearly learn how far apart the House and Senate are or how close together they are. Where do you well, see things? Well, Sandy, we've had historic tax relief passed through both the House and the Senate. In reality, where the Senate moved was to, in many ways, the, the amendments they made at the end made their bill much more similar to the House. So there's a few issues that need to be reconciled, but we really believe this should flow uh, fluidly. We believe that probably uh, it'll be a bill on the president's desk the week of December 18th. And uh, I think everybody's anxious to go ahead and What do you think this. will be the biggest issue? Uh, well, look, I think the biggest issue, frankly, is that we are providing massive tax relief to middle-income families and providing corporate relief that will bring jobs back into our country. Those are the focus points that everybody on the Republican side understands. In fact, those are even issues that Democrats argued they wanted, but unfortunately chose not to be a part of the process with us. But nonetheless, we have the votes to deliver that for the American people. All right. And so, of course, the big difference is the Senate bill cuts individual taxes only through 2025. And then, of course, the repeal of the Obama mandate in the Senate version. Mark, thanks for coming on with us this morning. Any predictions for the week? Will it be, a, will it be similar to last? Unpredictable? Well, I think it'll be unpredictable. Every week here seems to be. But, Sandra, the reality is the House also supported the individual mandate. They just wanted the Senate to go first. So I think that there's a lot of unity on that point, too. All right, Mark Short, thank you for coming on. Good to see you. Of course. Thanks for having Bit me. Bit of an understatement, right? <laughs> a lot going on, right? I mean, the things you ticked off at 9 o'clock this morning, Ooh. right? Just boom, boom, boom. Uh, stand by. We'll see whether or not we get a vote before Christmas. But we really get a sense that we're going to watch this just as close as we did the Senate vote oh, last yeah. week. And then that, that yep. Friday deadline looming for the government shutdown. Yes, it does. ABC News now admitting a serious error and covering Michael Flynn's guilty plea ahead. What they got wrong and the price one of their top reporters is now paying. Stay tuned for that and this. Fox News alert the U.S. and South Korea kicking off five days of joint military drill, sending a strong message to North Korea. And the acquittal in the Kate Steinle murder trial reigniting the debate over sanctuary cities. In a moment, a new bill that would jail elected officials for protecting illegals as the acting ICE director speaks out for the first time since that verdict. I actually sat there stunned for a good 15, 20 minutes. It sickened me. This isn't the America I grew up in uh, for, for a city to knowingly release a public safety threat back into the public. It's just ridiculous. Some more breaking news right now from overseas. Fox News confirming Yemen's former president has been killed by Iranian-backed rebels in an apparent RPG and gun attack on his car in Yemen's capital city. Uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh ruled Yemen for more than three decades. The rebels, who were once his allies, say that he was trying to escape to Saudi Arabia, which announced its support for Saleh hours before word of his death. So that news breaking from overseas right now. Stay tuned for more on that as we get it. Having been the object of Brian Ross's so-called investigative approach to journalism, uh, I found him to be one of the most recklessly dishonest journalists I've ever dealt with, and that's saying a lot because I've dealt with a few. Brian Ross has been unmasked as a person who has his own agenda, but it's not truth. Mike Huckabee calling out Brian Ross after ABC News suspended their investigative reporter. The move coming after he incorrectly reported that candidate Trump had directed former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn to contact the Russians. Ross later corrected that to say his source told him President-elect Trump had done that, saying, quote, my job is to hold people accountable, and that's why I agree with being held accountable myself. Let's bring in Fox News media analyst and host of Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz, who I'm sure has some strong feelings on what happened about midday on Friday and dramatically affected many things in Washington as well as here in New York. The stock market took a hit. On that report. Now, what, what happened, Sandra, is that Brian Ross made a colossal mistake that is simply inexcusable when the stakes are this high. You cannot accuse a president of ordering his advisor during the campaign when it has a whiff of collusion to contact Russia based on an unnamed confidant and then just simply take it back and say, well, it was after the election, because obviously if it's after the election and he's president-elect, uh, that is more understandable. Now, Brian Ross uh, is a good reporter who's won a slew of awards, but it's not the first high-profile mistake that he's made. For instance, uh, during after the Aurora, Colorado shooting, he erroneously tied the shooter to the Tea Party and had to apologize for that. 
You know, and the president's actually talking about the people that lost money potentially on that report and having such a big impact on the stock market, um, calling him false and dishonest. And he said it caused the stock market to drop 350 points. Um, there were probably people, to the president's point, that thought lost some money here. Well, the market plunge wasn't only because of the Brian Ross report. After all, Mike Flynn had just pleaded guilty, which, you know, cr creates a, an atmosphere of uncertainty in terms of Washington, which Wall Street never likes. And nobody's going to win a suit on this. But it certainly, ABC certainly gave the president an opening uh, for that kind of criticism. And ABC was kind of tone deaf at the beginning because first the, the uh, mistake was described as a clarification. Then mm -hmm. it was upgraded to a correction. And then... ABC executives apologized and suspended uh, Brian Ross without pay for four weeks. Four weeks, is that enough? Um, I'll leave that up to others to judge, but I do think uh, ABC needed to show that it took this kind of mistake, this high-profile mistake, this damaging mistake, very seriously. All right, I want to get to this because Billy Bush is re-entering the public eye. He has published a, an opinion piece in the New York, uh, New York Times. Yes, Donald Trump, you said that. Why are we hearing from Billy Bush now? Well, one, President Trump gave Billy Bush an opening because there have been reports that privately, at least, the president is said to be questioning whether that was really his voice on the Access Hollywood take. Strategically, Billy Bush is trying to rehabilitate his career. When you look back, he's a guy who uh, played along with what the president now calls locker room talk when Donald Trump was a huge celebrity at NBC more than a decade ago. He lost his job. Trump obviously went on to bigger and better things. And I think this is a very heartfelt piece that might cause people to look at Billy Bush uh, a little differently than uh, in the heat of the moment. The timing is interesting and leading a lot of people to wonder why. Uh, he published this online Sunday night. This is one day, Howie, before he appeared on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. And the interview, we are told, was arranged just a few days before that. Uh, and then he decided to speak, so in, in the form of this op-ed. Any, any reasons for the timing of this? Well, obviously, it's an orchestrated effort on Billy Bush's part to get some attention. He kind of been, he's kind of been a forgotten footnote in that whole Access Hollywood tape affair. And so that's how you do it. You, you put it online, then the Times publishes it this morning, then you go on Colbert, who's no fan of President Trump. Right. And he criticizes President Trump here. But look, when Billy Bush writes that the last year for him, because we've all sort of forgotten about him, mm -hmm. has been one of anger, anxiety, betrayal, humiliation, many selfish but I hope understandable emotions, it's hard not to feel some sympathy for the guy. He didn't do anything terrible, although he did play along with what, in retrospect, when it was played in the heat of the presidential campaign, it looked really bad. Howie Kurtz, good to see you. Same here, Sandra. Thank you. There is a new book by a one-time Trump campaign insider, two of them, in fact, pulling back the curtains on that historic White House run. This book, Chuck, and what we talk about in the book is about the Trump campaign and the Trump rise and what the president saw, what the candidate saw, what the reaction was of the American people. So former Trump campaign workers Corey Lewandowski and David Bossie now dishing on the most unique campaign for the White House ever. What they tell us about the president. Have a look at that next. Plus a stunning sight as a super moon lights up the night sky. What makes it so dazzling next get your moon dance ready mm. fly me to the moon let me play among the stars let last night when this year's one and only so-called super moon was visible around the world the massive moon behind the statue of liberty and other beautiful scenes Scientists say the supermoon appears about 14% bigger to the naked eye because it's as close to Earth as possible during oh. a given orbit. Two things. Yes. We have a moon dance in our house. Uh, you know, we see the moon. Like, this, this was absolutely spectacularly beautiful. And two, I love that song. Thank you to our I like both that. of those. <laughs> okay. right on. Look Moving to the on. sky. It was really extraordinary. You too, did. You got a glimpse of it. Beautiful stuff. Excellent. So, all right. 25 right. minutes past. Here we go. There is a new book taking an inside look at the presidential campaign of Donald Trump. Written by former Trump campaign and manager Corey Lewandowski and former deputy campaign manager David Bossie. It's called Let Trump Be Trump. And Lewandowski says his boss ran a tight ship, leaving nothing to chance. 
he demands such perfection and he deserves it. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. We wanted that campaign to be perfect from the time the music was cued to the time he walked on the stage to the walked off and the little things. He is so good at those little details. Very interesting revelations now. Byron York, chief political correspondent, Washington Examiner, Fox News contributor. How you doing, Byron? Good day. Good to morning. You I, I saw some excerpts over the weekend. Mm -hmm. What do you think it tells us? Well, this is the first really inside account of maybe the most incredible presidential campaign ever. And I think the title of it, Let Trump Be Trump, is, is very telling here because it refers to this battle inside the campaign between some advisors who wanted Donald Trump to tone down his act, to be a little more presidential, to just quiet down a little bit, and others, and Trump himself, who said, no, 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 going to be myself. Uh, I, I am what I am. I turn it up to 11, and mm. he won, and they won. Uh, the title is interesting. Come back to that in a second. There was this exchange where the president, then a candidate, was ticked off at Paul Manafort. And they were flying on the plane. He asked the pilot to lower the altitude so he could call Manafort. And Lewandowski says part of that conversation went like this, okay? Just going to pull out one small quote. Tone it down. I want to turn it up. Now, just take that quote there. But Manafort was fired, so was Lewandowski, and we, we know that now. But those words, tone it down, I want to turn it up, I, I think that that embraces who Donald Trump is more than anything, because he turns it up on everything, Byron. He does. He does. And, and, and I think what, what the book shows uh, is there'll, there'll be a lot of attention paid to some of the, very, the colorful stuff in it, uh, but the fact was... Donald Trump was an unconventional uh, politician who had an almost supernatural ability to connect with the voters that a Republican needed to be elected president. Uh, and so he had all of these advisors, none of whom had ever been elected president themselves, telling him he had to, you know, cool it, calm down, tone it down. Uh, and his, his instinct told him not to do that. And, and in almost every situation in the campaign in which he got in trouble, he would choose to double down or triple down, uh, and he ended up getting uh, elected. So that's where the let Trump be Trump thing comes from. Uh, I'm going to read one more paragraph here that was put out, okay? Here it is. Sooner or later, Lewandowski and Bossy write, everybody who works for Donald Trump will see a side of him that makes you wonder why you took a job with him in the first place. His wrath is never intended as any personal offense, but sometimes it can be hard not to take it that way. The mode that he switches into when things are not going his way can feel like an all-out assault. It break most hardened men and women into little pieces, end quote. Um, we're going to have them on later in the week here, but my impression of that campaign was a campaign that was living hour to hour. It wasn't day to day or, or, or week to week. I mean, they... They were really trying to figure it out as, as they went along. And I just wonder, I'm, we, I saw you on the trail so much, and I, I just wonder if that was your impression as well. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was being planned on uh, the fly, but that was often in kind of a day-to-day -day sense. I think Donald Trump had a bigger strategic idea of, of uh, how to appeal to, to Republican voters. He had, he had an instinctive sense that Republican voters were disillusioned not only with Barack Obama, but with, with George W. Bush and the whole Republican establishment. Trump instinctively knew this. He's not a political science, scientist. He doesn't read a lot of political books, but he somehow knew this. And I think uh, these two staffers, by the way, neither of whom followed Trump into the White House, um, Interesting. Uh, under yeah. understood that Trump had this supernatural talent. Yeah. Thank you, Byron. There's a lot in that book. Thank Appreciate you, Bill. the analysis in Washington. Thank you. The U.S. and South Korea joining for a massive show of force, sending a message to North Korea as the White House issues new words of warning to the rogue regime. Meanwhile, one of our top stories today, President Trump calling out the FBI, calling out the former director, James Comey, after a bombshell report revealing Robert Mueller fired a top agent for anti-Trump text messages. I would just say this to the president. There's an ongoing criminal investigation. Comey may be part of it. You tweet and comment uh, regarding ongoing criminal investigations at your own peril. I'd be careful if I were you, Mr. President. I've watched this.
taking a few shots at the FBI after reports of special counsel Robert Mueller fired a top agent back in August from the Russian investigation team for exchanging anti-Trump text messages. That agent also worked in the Clinton email investigation. The president saying this, quote, after years of Comey with the phony and dishonest Clinton investigation and more. Running the FBI, its reputation is in tatters, worst in history, but fear not, we will bring it back to greatness. Congressman Peter King from New York spoke with us earlier about what that all might mean in the end. The fact that he was so anti-Trump and that this is right in the middle of a presidential campaign, it really class, uh, puts a whole shadow over the, uh, you know, the findings of that investigation. I have a great respect for the FBI, but I think as far as that particular agent and his role in it, that does warrant investigation. Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Anna Napolitano with me now. Good day to you. Hey, we got a lot of legal stuff to go through here first. Ready. On that point with regard to this FBI agent, you say no big deal. I say no big deal unless the politics clouds the behavior or animates the behavior. Because you find an FBI agent that doesn't have a political opinion and you're not going to find a serious but thinker. He, I don't think he was just an FBI agent, right? Of, of which there were 8,000, is that right? Yes, That's FBI, what you said. the but FBI's he, he job. He dealt with the Clinton email investigation. Does it change your view? No. What, what my view is that Jim Comey was wrong to exonerate not his decision to make and there's overwhelming evidence of her guilt but the manpower or person power that actually extracts evidence and gathers information that is an apolitical job and it doesn't matter what the politics are of the people who mm. do it yeah. that information then goes to Justice Department lawyers who decide what to do with it in the Hillary Clinton case it never made its way to Justice Department lawyers Jim Comey short-circuited it and said we're not going to prosecute but there are already suggesting this should be reopened and investigated again. I should have it? been arguing for 11 months, the duration of the president's term in office, that Attorney General Sessions should re-examine the file, give it to a half dozen prosecutors, and tell them to present it to a grand jury. Why they're not doing it is beyond me. The evidence okay. of her guilt is there. Um, topic number two, and this deals with General Flynn. All right, the president tweeting over the weekend and taking some heat for that, but uh, he said this in part. I had to fire General Flynn because he lied to the vice president and the FBI. He has pled guilty to those lies. It is a shame because his actions during the transition were lawful. There was nothing to hide, he also said. I never asked Comey to stop investigating Flynn, just more fake news covering another Comey lie. What is your view on that Well, Jim today? Comey has said under oath that the president asked him to stop investigating Flynn. Uh, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats has said the president asked him to ask Comey, and Director of NSA Admiral Rogers said the president asked him to ask Comey. So you can decide who you want to believe. If the president asked Comey to back off of Flynn for a non-corrupt purpose, like, I feel sorry for him, he's been through enough, leave him, leave him alone. Or, doesn't the FBI have more important things to do, like go after terrorists or bank robbers? That's not obstruction of justice. But if the president did it for a corrupt purpose, and this is what's in the president's mind, we can gather what's in his mind from his behavior, like, I'm worried about what Mike Flynn might say about Jared Kushner or about me. That's a corrupt purpose. That's obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice is a crime, no matter who commits it. If done for it, obstruct a corrupt purpose. It's also an impeachable offense. You're arguing motive. Yes, and that's how that, do you determine motive? By behavior. It's not easy to prove. It is intentionally not easy to prove, so as to give the president a lot of leeway. All right. Senator if, Feinstein is arguing this is obstruction of justice and she thinks that Mueller's building that case. Alan Dershowitz argues you can't charge a president with obstruction for exercising his constitutional power. Tell that to, who, tell that to Richard would, Nixon. He's correct. I respect, uh, I respect um, uh, Professor Dershowitz greatly. I do not know uh, Senator Feinstein, but she, in my view, is correct here. If the interference with a law enforcement or judicial proceeding is for a corrupt purpose, there is no immunity for the president. Anybody can be ensnared who does that for a corrupt purpose. Difficult to prove, prove the purpose, as you just point out. We have a lot to discuss yes. in the coming days. Yes, weeks. we do. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. All right, 22 minutes now before the hour. Well, the U.S. and South Korea launching a series of military drills today using hundreds of aircraft and a massive show of force. This comes just a week after North Korea's latest missile test, which is prompting new warnings from the Trump administration. Benjamin Hall is live in London with the very latest. Ben? 
Uh, hi, Sandra. These are among the biggest live fire drills that we have ever seen. And although the U.S. says that they were planned long before the recent nuclear missile test, the scale of them suggests otherwise. The five day live fire drill, which is called Vigilant Ace, is meant to improve U.S. and South Korean wartime capabilities. And an unusually large number of the latest generation stealth fighter jets are taking part. This includes six F 22s and 18 F 35s. Also, about 12,000 U.S. military personnel are participating. It comes just a week after that latest ICBM test launched by North Korea that puts almost all of the U.S. within range. Today, it also emerged that a Cathay Pacific airplane crew flying from the U.S. to China actually saw the missile as it plunged back through the atmosphere. And then yesterday, Senator Lindsey Graham came out and said he felt all U.S. military families should be pulled out of South Korea because, in his words, war with North Korea was close. President Trump has spoken to President Xi of China. He's threatened more sanctions. And also yesterday, H.R. McMaster spoke to Fox News Sunday on the subject. Here's what he said. If necessary, the president and the United States will have to take care of it because he said he's not going to allow this murderous rogue regime to threaten the United States well, with, with the most destructive that, weapons on my Earth. Final but threaten is what they continue to do. And North Korea yesterday called President Trump insane, adding that it was the U.S. administration that was begging for war. So no end to the rhetoric from the North. And also, they are clearly continuing down the path towards their goal of uh, successfully mounting a miniaturized warhead on an ICBM. And they seem to be getting closer all the time. Back to you guys. Benjamin Hall in London, thank you. Sandra, there is new fallout from the stunning verdict in the Kate Steinle murder trial. One lawmaker now promising prison time for an elected official who helped shelter illegals as the Trump administration continues its push to target sanctuary cities in America. And under this president, this president done more for more security and public safety than any of the